My name is Jennifer Gray Thompson, and I am the CEO of After the Fire. Welcome to the podcast, How to Disaster, Recover, Rebuild, and Reimagine. In this podcast, we bring you the very best practices, best hearts, and great ideas from other disaster-affected communities. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to the How to Disaster podcast, where we help you recover, rebuild, and reimagine. My name is Jennifer Gray Thompson, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of After the Fire. On today's episode, I'm happy to welcome Cherry Jokum, who is the Recovery Coordination Group Manager and Philanthropic Advisor for FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Cherry works closely with state, county, federal, and private partners. She builds relationships to pursue a successful recovery after a disaster happens. I invited Cherry on today because she has a wealth of experience collaborating across organizations and sectors for disaster response, recovery, program support, implementation, and execution. You can find out more about FEMA and Cherry's work by checking the links in the description or find her on her LinkedIn and Twitter. A big welcome to Cherry, to the How to Disaster podcast, and as always, thank you for joining us today. So I wanted to have Cherry on today because, um, you know, I've been working in the field of disaster for four years. Um, Our anniversary is actually this October 8th. And one of the really challenging things is, is like, how do you even begin to navigate these behemoth agencies? And then you, and then I was very fortunate to meet um, Cherry about a year into my uh, term, my tenure in this job. And one of the things that really struck me about her was how she really brings a very human element to what is often a mystifying and can even be a process in the middle of a trauma. And so I asked her here, I asked her on our podcast today to talk to her as a colleague and as a friend. Um, and how is it that she got into this work? I'd like her to tell us a little bit about her background. And then we'll get into the actual day-to-day function of her job and how she performs sort of that very human work, uh, providing a bridge between a disaster recovery agency and the people who are directly affected. So um, once again, welcome to the podcast, Cherry. Oh, thanks so much, Jennifer. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I was very impressed when I met you as well. You were uh, highly recommended. I think you were on some panels that... uh, uh, I think it was Gladys Cook with the Florida Housing Coalition. And so she was just, you have to meet this person. (laughs) And so uh, she wasn't wrong. And so I continue to keep up with you on uh, social and uh, just really delighted uh, to be here and to share my experiences in the disaster recovery world. So I'm hoping that you can actually share with our listeners about how did you even get into, what's your story? How did you even get into this work? Well, what usually happens is that I'm a disaster survivor, and it was quite accidental. Um, I actually uh, owned and uh, ran and launched an executive search firm. And so when Katrina hit, I'm a New Orleans native. Um, I actually was living in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, which is uh, where the joint field office, the JFO, uh, stood up, as we call it in uh, uh, federal parlance. And uh, I thought, well, why don't I get a contract to do their hiring? <laughs> you know, because uh, certainly there, there will be lots of hiring that will happen. So what happened is they called me to come interview. And I was really uh, in the dark about what was happening. Katrina was such um, a devastating disaster. It was, it was huge. So what they hired me to do was to become a human resources uh, uh, manager, or, or actually specialist, I'm sorry, not, not manager. And uh, it was such an intense disaster that it was a um, you know 24-7 round the clock, and we all worked like seven twelves, and that was the kind of commitment. So I always tell everyone I didn't see my children for a year <laughs> because, you know, it's, it's pretty intense. So we did do an inordinate amount of uh, hiring, uh, you know, you, you name it, from logistics to uh, very, to engineers. It, it was so devastating um, to so many parishes. 
So that's how I started. It was um, quite accidental. I I wasn't necessarily affected as most people were because um, I lived down the street from a hospital. I, I did at the time, so we were on that electrical grid. You know, I was inconvenienced rather than devastated. But it really was, um, I think I was just so astounded. For one thing, the FBI was on site to do fingerprinting, and I'd never been at a place in my life that you interviewed and they said, we'll see you at seven tomorrow morning. Wow. And that is how it had, I thought, that, you know, it was, it was mind blowing. So it was an experience of a lifetime. And uh, I eventually, well, since I was hiring for all of the um, higher level folks, I uh, was brought into what was then called ESF-14, the emergency support function, which was a long-term recovery. So we were the... That was the um, section that was uh, charged with uh, the housing, um, the housing mission for uh, setting up what they called at that time. This was um, 15, 16 years ago, because Katrina was in 2005. Mm -hmm. That was, um, they called, it, they had this vision because each, um, the management, the leadership that comes in and, um, and, and runs a disaster, the different sections, this ESF-14, they started what they called storefronts in each parish. And it was, uh, it was staffed with um, uh, planners and engineers because everything was affected in, in post-Katrina, everything. Uh, you know, levees had to be rebuilt to the tune of billions. Uh, the entire infrastructure of communities were just wiped out. Housing was gone. So that's how I got my start. <laughs> You know, I'm amazed at how many people um, get into this work exactly sort of the same way by virtue of necessity and not by design. And um, in some ways that can be really helpful. Like we don't even hire people for after the fire who haven't been through a disaster. I know I tried that once and I was like, can't train for it, can't explain it. You know, if you haven't been through it. And it doesn't, it's not even that they have to have lost their home. Like it's probably fortunate that you didn't because had you lost your home, That's right. I don't, how would you have had the capacity to serve um, seven days a week, 12 hours a day? It's just remarkable. What have you seen um, in your, now you have, the interesting thing about Katrina too, and when I was in graduate school, we definitely studied um, the changes in the federal government response um, post uh, hurricane Katrina. And so from your perspective, just watching how disaster has changed over the last 16 years and your participation, especially with wind and rain, what changes have you seen that um, are most striking to you? Well, I think in, in my view, I see a lot of changes um, socially, culturally, and also, um, and, and, and we're saying this, the, you know, there's no longer an elephant in the room. We, we're saying what it is. It's climate change, right? There's, there's no way. I mean, it hasn't stopped raining in uh, uh, Georgia, uh, Louisiana, Florida, where we are. I mean, uh, you know, it's been raining here. I've been here for two weeks. It just hasn't stopped raining. And this is unusual. Uh, look at Louisiana and the uh, na the adjacent states. Uh, will they even be there? I wonder in a couple of years. <laughs> and so I see that changing. I see, you know, although the administration changes in FEMA, culturally, they're very responsive. So as we see in the rest of the, the country, where the buzzwords are equity and fairness and reaching uh, marginalized folks, we're looking at our policies, and I see um, the I see the administration really taking that to heart. I mean, there's there's a lot happening internally that I think uh, you know it, everything from who who is being hired, backgrounds. There's a lot of sensitivity, and I think that they're no longer um, tolerating things that have been tolerated or. Uh, where awareness wasn't in the past. And we're also looking at, um, I see a big movement to address um, inconsistencies and inequities and in disaster um, uh, distribution, how we, how, we how we work with folks, how we uh, distribute um, disaster assistance. And 
it, I think it, it's ver- it's real, it's authentic, and um, they care about what they're doing. So I'm happy to see that. So, you know, often we think of big agencies. We don't always think about the people who actually make that agency run. When people are like, the government this and the government that, one of our roles is to say, well, who do you think the government is? The government is people. And they are people who are often actually quite um, excellent. Maybe the system doesn't always work, but in the case of um, at FEMA, they actually have to be designed for, you know, 320 million people at a time. And so I wanted you to actually talk about, so what is, what's it like to work in a, uh, in a place where you could be deployed easily for many, many months? And I, I know that you live in Florida now. Um, mm-hmm. Can you take us from your time in Baton Rouge, working on Katrina, all the way to your current um, position and, and what it is exactly that you do? What does that look like? Well, you're right. It is, it is disruptive to a family, regardless of what kind of commitment or arrangements you make. And, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a perfect job for many levels of folks. I happen to be what is called a reservist, which means, uh, I am like the military. I I'm called up to deploy when there's a, there's, there's need and my, um, expertise is requested, but I, you know, I have to, deploy anywhere, anytime, it may be in austere conditions. And, you know, I was lucky to have, you know, a husband who, you know, works with me and accepts what I've been doing. And um, he actually works for FEMA too now. (laughs) (laughs) But there were a lot of disruptions in our lives. Uh, He'll say, you've been gone for 15 years. And I say, well, not constantly, because I did take, I did leave FEMA at times and take other positions, right, in these periods of these lulls or what I had stepped away. But I would say for the book, there are different, you know, different types of employment with FEMA. We have permanent full-time. We have um, cores, which are a cadre of on-call, um, on-call with a core cadre of on-call, you know, response employees and the reservists like myself. So the cores are almost like a full-timer with a two to four year with a chance to re-up. So um, it's just, and we have regions across um, yeah. across the country. So, you know, I you can really live anywhere as a reservist and, you know, just you have to agree to deploy at any time for extended periods of time. And I think the people that do it, um, they really are committed uh, or you wouldn't be doing this because, you know, many say, well, we're not doing, you know, I, I don't have any, uh, I don't have, there's nothing that could keep me here like monetarily, right? I, I don't have those types of things going on. I don't mean I don't make money. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not a permanent situation, right? Any day. Yeah. Um, but I, I feel like it's something that you uh, have a commitment to. Mm-hmm. That it just it, it's just something you want to do because it isn't for everyone. Like a lot of folks, you know, you can't take this as you could. I think a lot of reservists come in um, and think they can do it, and then maybe there's in, can, there's a lull. It, it's not a full time job, and you know it does hurt sometimes when you have to leave. So you know mm-hmm. we do that. We we ramp up and we um, ramp down, and so you know you have to leave <laughs> when yeah, it's time right. for you to go. And that's tough for some people because then, you know, a lot of us are in mourning because you, you know, you really come to, you know, like or love your coworkers and you become a family. And I think yeah. that that's actually, um, you know, I think that that's not uncommon for some of us who work in disaster that, it's a, my Mastiff is snoring. So if you, if you hear oh, her hear or see her, okay, I'm just giving you a heads up. Oh, Sorry, uh, listening audience, but that's Gigi yeah. and she's part of the deal. So, <laughs> right. um, yeah, I remember when we had our disaster and having never been through that before. And I've said this many times, right? It was a really terrifying, um, physical experience. It was the most remarkable human experience of my life. And I think that part of the work that I've done since then is I, I do like revisiting that humanity. And, um, I remember that, uh, Lindsay Anderson, who works for FEMA, she came out, um, not under the auspices of FEMA, but she's working for the university of Pittsburgh as their interim director. Director. 
And she came out to do a podcast and interviewed me. And at the end of it, she said two things. She said, I should try to go work for FEMA. And I was like, why would FEMA want me? Like, honestly, that's what I thought. And then um, the second thing was, is that I should read this book called A Paradise Built in Hell by um, Rebecca Solnit. And it's a series of essays about how people actually respond in disaster to each other. And we're often sold the idea that um, when, when something bad happens, that we all like grab our guns and we go into our basements and, you know, like, like very dystopian. But mm -hmm. um, in, in my experience, with the exception of moments of COVID, um, in my experience, that's actually the opposite, that if we have something, we share it, we share whatever it is. And I'm wondering like how that factors into you, the, the decision or the culture of your um, people, that, of the people that you work with when you walk into these communities, they're most vulnerable and you're able to be um, hopefully a light for them or something to grab onto. Can you talk about that dynamic? I think you're right. I think for the most part, they are grateful. They they need help. They're uh, um, they're, they're grasping their last straw. Um, this is so traumatic, and like nothing, you know, it's it's a it's a death a million times over. Everything they a lot of times they've lost everything. Maybe friends and family, their animals. Um, it's unfathomable, and uh, you know, I think sometimes when we get one of the things we're working on, we get further into this, the process, the um, administrator ap administrative application part can take so much longer, then that's when you see a change in people. You know, there's an, there's a, an expectation that the government is uh, here to make you whole, and that's the opposite of what we do. And, um, you know, the simplest thing I can say is, you know, these are our tax, all of our tax dollars at work, and it, it, it's just impossible to um, put everyone, you know, just uh, reset and put everyone where they were before the the, uh, the weather event or the disaster happened. But I, I think for the most part, everyone who works for FEMA, the, um, the you know, the disaster survival um, assistance folks, the individual assistance folks who are out there in the field, they are doing their best. You know, we still have policies and regulations, and you can imagine things we were able to do before, we're not able to do now. For instance, um, let me just do uh, yeah, share We love analogy. examples. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like an analogy, we, you know, we still have laws and regulations, even though we're breaking down those barriers, but we can't go get expired food right? It could feed tons of people and it doesn't mean the food is bad, but it, you know, laws prevent us from doing that. And it, you know, to everyone's discredit, you know, we still have hunger. So I would say in the same ways, FEMA is uh, kind of hamstrung, but because of laws and regulations that aren't necessarily of our doing, right? So we still persist and, um, um, pursue alleviating human suffering to the best of our abilities, and uh, you know, with the with the parameters we have to work within. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the best way I can say it. I think that's a good way. I think that people don't always necessarily, you know, until a disaster hits you and you've never needed FEMA or an R, you know, and also your state agency, whatever that looks like. In our case, it's Cal OES working with FEMA. Mm -hmm. um, it's always very surprising. And, and it's not, it's not like, the thing is that a lot of the rules that came about, maybe they don't make sense, but they were usually made in response to some kind of situation or, you know, fraud or there was something came up and the, and the policy fix was meant to mitigate the chance of fraud and to increase accountability. But at the same time, there does come a point where it removes a lot of the creativity that's actually required in disaster. And, and people look, it's, they look towards one agency and they say, well, I don't understand why it's like that. And I, my right. response is, my guess is something happened. And the reason why government moves right. slowly is because at some point something happened and people, and somebody said, oh, someone should do something about that. And they did. And it slowed down the process or put in more checks and balances. That's always the, one of the struggles of a federal government that serves so many different types of communities, you know, which is how do you create policy for the entire country 
that um, doesn't always work in certain areas, you know, and I think that that's one of the things, and I know I'm going on and on, but the other thing I noticed in our disaster was I didn't, I had gone to graduate school in public administration, like we had studied FEMA, but I had never been through a disaster, so I didn't know, yeah. and then, um, you know, when I, when, when we lost 6,000 units of housing the first night, and it looked like a bomb went off and everything was different from the night before in our lives. And I looked around, I was like, oh, well, you know, Calvary will show up. And until right. then, um, I will, you know, do what I need to, you know, I'll figure, I'll listen for the needs and, um, and then they'll tell me what to do. And then, I, and then like three days went by, I'm like, I don't think they're coming. And it wasn't a FEMA <laughs> issue. It was that communities yeah. actually have to serve um, they have to fill in this huge um, space that is purposely left for them to lead and design their own response and recovery in a way that's most relevant for that community. And FEMA's role is to come in about 72, day, 72 hours, not days, later, and then provide some federal resources. Um, a lot of people also don't understand why FEMA isn't declared um, right away in any kind of disaster. I see a lot of confusion about that. So if you could address, like, what are the, like, what are the triggers for you to be deployed in your area? Well, the triggers for my deployment, but let me back up to your, sure. your point, your point about, uh, you know, so the, um, the declaration approved by the president has to exceed the resources of the, of, of the state. And that's not always the case. So there's a lot of checks and balances and thresholds and minimums, you know, that have to be met. So it isn't an arbitrary process. There are, you know, and unfortunately, people aren't able to see what's behind the scenes, you know, how that how that happens. Um, so, you know, you, you, you do get your leadership on the ground in the field and then they'll determine, you know, what will stand up? What are we going to erect here? Who, who, what is needed? Is it uh, individual assistance? Is it public assistance for facilities and emergency, um, emergency um, measures? You know, and, and that's how, this is how this happens. And then if the state requests uh, a season need for what I'm in, I'm in the, um, the integrated recovery coordination um, and do you yeah, want to sure. define that? Because a lot of people who listen to this podcast, I mean, not a lot of people listen to it, let's be honest, but the people sure. who do, not all of them know what that means. <laughs> right. And congratulations if you are listening. I love you. Okay. Oh. Right. <laughs> so integrated recovery coordination is working my, um, my team or my group from the National Disaster Recovery Support um, cadre. We work with other federal partners to um, you know, help uh, manage the resources and respond to the disaster, but we also integrate internally. So, you know, there's public assistance that section or sector. There's hazard mitigation. There's individual assistance that takes care of, uh, you know, uh, human needs, individuals and households. There is, um, like I said, hazard mitigation, public assistance for facilities, buildings, parks, uh, some some eligible nonprofits. So we work internally, and that's a big deal. You know, a lot of uh, places or in organizations have um, uh, sections within them that are siloed. So we're working really hard to break that down. And then, and so my team works internally to integrate, and then we work externally, and that's with uh, federal partners. Um, HHS, the Housing and Urban Development, the Department of the Interior, USDA, um, every federal agency that you can think of so that we can identify resources from that organization, from that federal government agency, and try to get it to the communities that need their um, technical assistance dollars, their assistance. We also work directly with the state. We are here at the request of the state. Mm -hmm. So we work, you know, we found, uh, so there's a recovery support function field coordinator from the federal agencies that work with their counterpart from the state. So when we uh, bring in these RSS, one of which comes from the Department of Commerce, um, Economic Development Administration, they will work with the, the, the whatever it's called at uh, California, 
-hmm. In Florida, it's the Department of Economic Opportunity, looks like DEO. So <laughs> every agent, every state has a different name. Yeah. So we, you know, those state feds and locals all work together. And then, you know, FEMA has a federal coordinating officer and uh, the state will, um, if, if we are brought in for the long-term recovery to assist them because it's their, um, it's their vision. We just help, help them uh, design, execute. yes, and execute, you know, what they see their vision for recovery. We bring in mitigation, help to bring in resiliency resources, all in, all in cooperation and coordination with our federal and state partners and then local nonprofits, foundations. So one of the areas I'm working really hard to um, not infiltrate, but to, to, to bring in and to work with is foundations because there's a, you know, private funding is really the key to all of this. Government can't do everything. And I feel as though, and, and some of us do, that there's a place for foundations. We bring, we can bring the unmet needs and, and, we're, and they're vetted to what is how I look at it. When, I, when we talk to a foundation, we can say, we're not showing favoritism to say the California fires, but we already know that here's what's missing. And this is where you can fill in that gap. And so that's what we try to do, help leverage the funding. If, if FEMA can pay for something, why don't we try to leverage it? Um, you know, maybe some gap funding's needed. So yeah. I think we, we play a really um, important part, but collectively we all will. Yeah. So, you know, that's Actually, what I'm I wanna, for. I wanna get into that pretty um, significantly. First, we're going to take a quick break for our sponsor, Fire Safe Science, and we'll be right back with Cherry Jokum. Thank you. This podcast is sponsored by Fire Safe Signs. In a disaster, seconds matter. Fire Safe Signs give first responders critical information like can a fire truck make it down the driveway? What water sources are available? Fire Safe Signs help property owners provide crucial information to first responders, and they're made in the USA. Getting this information in seconds helps save lives. Together, we make our community safe. Visit us today at firesafesigns.com. All right. So welcome back once again to the podcast, How to Disaster. Our guest today is a friend and colleague, Cherry Jokum. And I wanted to actually dive a little more deeply into uh, the role of foundations in sort of, because I know that, so when we were founded as a foundation in 2017, um, the idea was that we would do some grant making, but after really year one, and, and when everybody had sort of exited the market, when you have a massive disaster, a lot of, um, I would say, stakeholders and actors, they rush in, and then about 12 months post-disaster, for the most part, they are gone. Um, you can, FEMA will remain your, you know, your local, your county or your commissioner, commissioner's office, they will remain, the state will remain. And United policyholders is usually still there in our case on the, on the West coast to help with insurance. But for the most part, um, people exit the market. We have been um, tutoring and sort of mentoring in other areas to help them lead a community led and designed recovery um, by doing sort of mentoring and a, almost like a leadership academy. But we see continuously a huge gap in philanthropy. Um, private philanthropy on our coast, anyway, has been extraordinarily slow to um, actually come into the market of disaster. They're interested in mitigation, and I appreciate that. And we have an entire part of our organization called Before the Fire, and we love that because we're hoping not to burn down like this forever. That would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, we support that. And we we have federal and state funding for those programs, but I'm... Um, often frustrated by the lack of support for all these uh, people essentially who have um, very uh, worthy organizations and ideas often from emergent leaders and there's really it's very hard to get funding so can you little little bit can you talk about that or any advice that you would give to these organizations we started with two million so we were very fortunate in that way and it allowed us to actually learn how to stand ourselves up post disaster um, but I don't have that two million to give to other organizations and all I can give them is our experience. 
support. We need to talk to Mackenzie Scott. <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk to anybody you want me to. <laughs> for, seed, for seed funding. Yeah. Actually, I, I would say we are making inroads. We, um, we are talking to foundations and the we were called philanthropic or philanthropy funding advisors, philanthropy advisors uh, uh, some time ago. And now we're really called uh, recovery funding. But we do have um, an, a mutual, um, uh, have a relationship with the Council on Foundations, right? Their policy, um, they do a lot out of DC. So one of our, um, our lead um, F, uh, federal disaster recovery officers is, is, is a member of the Council on Foundations. And they're a really important organization because I would say they're the um, the preeminent organization speaking to government, uh, you know, following legislation, um, making making a lot of helping to inform a lot of policy. And they know all they're connected with all of the foundation members around the country. So I think we're trying to have that conversation. I don't know that we're as comfortable. I'm comfortable because I come from a fundraising, a development background. But I think we haven't made the case that if I'm going to show you um, your your state's fire, maybe if I share that with a foundation, am I showing um, some kind of uh, you know, preference, am I, am I, right. is there someone else that's not, and, and it's not that at all. I mean, when there are a lot of times people will contact us or an organization or an agency and tell us of their concern, uh, they're desperate, they're working in the community. And so that's elevated um, to us. And then I call it quiet inquir inquiries, mm -hmm. which, I, you know, I'm, I'm saying, I'm not really asking this question, you know, because I can't really uh, compromise myself, but I, I don't know that I necessarily agree, but then again, I do belong to this agency and represent this agency and un yeah. until it's okay, but I'm, I'm still doing that, but as carefully and as diplomatically and as, um, like I said, as carefully as I can, but isn't that uh, really just the learning curve of it though? I, I mean, I, I, one of the things, so side sidebar um, after i after i um, met cherry and i uh, or you recommended to me and you started sending me for florida all of the like you decipher all of the funds and it's all for florida but i i i go through no pun intended and cherry pick for years i'd be like oh there's an opportunity but i was oh it, just no, yeah. just even though like i it's true i wouldn't look at the state stuff but your ability though to send out relevant links and explanations and the highlighting and the bold like that I, I don't know if I don't know if you fully understand the power of that for somebody like me in a very small nonprofit with a big impact and a big mission to be able to just open up your email and be like oh, curated like and it's not even meant for me it's meant for people in Florida but you put me on there because you know the value of your work I have many times taken that information and sent it to our public sector partners because that's a lot of it what it's meant, you know, it's fine, like USDA or um, local partners, county leads, supervisors, and said, you should look into this. But I really, I don't know if you really understand the value of that service. And it's been a very big deal for me. So thank you. Oh, thank you so much. And you know, I've heard that. I, I have to share with you, I received an email when I was working uh, Hurricane Michael in the early, well, I, then I subsequently did uh, uh, Hurricane Sally. I mean, nothing to you, but I, you go on to another disaster yeah. normally. I think Michael um, is, I think you're the reason why um, FEMA um, um, flew me out to Hurricane Michael post-disaster. <laughs> I, I think so, but uh, they are delighted. So I received an email from a small county with maybe, and that's the problem is capacity. And, um, you know, uh, yeah, they have, they're so under-resourced. And she wrote and she said, you know, it was really bittersweet. She says, thanks so much, means so much to me. 
I can't apply for any of these grants. I'm one person, you know, she's got 10 hats. Her house is destroyed. She's running a town. She's probably, you know, handling the parks director, you know, infrastructure. So anyway, but but they they have thanked me and I know the value and I constantly um, make the case for myself, but I'm not the only one doing it. There's several others. We do have a, FEMA has this Max Tracks Recovery Resource Library, and we're working hard to sponsor foundations and in the, into their executive directors. There's no need you you would. I want be, in uh, on that. You should be in on that. You are uh, the best candidate to be in there, and you know those are curated and vetted all day long by by our. Um, I call them Max Tracks Resource Librarians, but you know. Anyway, we love a librarian. That. <laughs> we do. I, I hired a librarian, actually, professional to be our um, community to community program director, and and, and uh, Pamela Van Halsema, and specifically love her librarian side because she knows how to vet information, share information, and remain entirely human. And she's also no a fire lost. survivor. And <laughs> oh, oh my fantastic. goodness! And she did our website too. So shout out oh, to fantastic. Pamela. Wow. Ten, 10 people at one. <laughs> oh, you know, we all have, yeah. but I think that's pretty common in disaster yeah. is that, um, and it yes. really, you know, I always say I'm only limited by my capacity. Like that's it. Like I could easily run a hundred people, um, dogged, um, with the work that there needs to be done, but instead right. I run five people, um, pretty, pretty tough, you know, and, and the, the, we all have to wear a lot of hats and that's the deal. And I'm absolutely not complaining, but I would, I do think we could be far more effective. A lot of these organizations could be more effective with capacity because just applying for a federal grant side notes. Um, last year I had a person of note say to me, Oh, Jen, you're never going to get a federal uh, grant. You know, you're just not. And I won't say who that person was. And I was like, huh, hmm. watch me. And so then we did, and we got a USDA RCPP grant, and that's really um, due to a staff member, uh, Molly Curly O'Brien, who is just very, very smart, very capable, um, working with RCDs to figure out this grant application, which also required, though, a, a match. And so it really often comes down to not only the capacity, but the match requirements. Um, it, so can you talk about, can you give any advice to people who are listening to this podcast and they're like, I don't even know where to begin on how to do that process. I think that's what we're trying to put together. Usually at every disaster is, um, find technical assistance, grant resources, because in, in my group, we don't bring dollars. You know, we, we're not, uh, the public assistance Stafford act funding. We don't have a checkbook. What we have is we're trying to corral and work with all of our partners and the foundations. Like I said, we're, you know, uh, it's not that they don't do a lot, they do, but we would like to have input and help guide them. So we talk about matching and leveraging funds. That's where it's essential. Uh, I would say connect immediately with um, a, a regional planning council uh, that, that writes grants, the universities, because you're going to need help. Maybe uh, another good way that we've tried, because we can't get around that you need a recovery manager and mm -hmm. you need additional staff, uh, look at AmeriCorps programs because right. they can't write the grant, but you could certainly have them working on the, uh, the work, have them um, launching and implementing, but use every resource possible. And we do try to help at FEMA, help you identify resources. Is there a place that say if someone, um, you know, like if say you're in Plumas County where we're working in Greenville right now, um, we're going to go up next Thursday. And um, so they have limited capacity, very small county, 15,000 people. Um, Greenville was 900 people. It's 90% gone. Um, but they do care. They do want to rebuild. Um, and so we will help them manage some of that. But is there like a single website that's that you can recommend to them to go to look for all of those resources or am I dreaming? I don't know that you're dreaming, but they can certainly, I think if there's a, if, if there's a planning council or a commission that um, it's a city or a town. So it, it's, it's a, not, in, it's not incorporated. And that's another okay. thing that comes up, but Plumas County 
is a county, a very rural county of about 15,000. Greenville sits inside of that county. There's a, a bunch of small little towns without their own governance structures. And um, even their county uh, supervisors, sometimes called county commissioners in other states, are, all have full-time jobs. This is not their full-time job. That's right. So it's extremely limited capacity. So, and we see that a lot. We've seen that a lot in Oregon. Um, very, really, a lot of our focus is on rural um, America, you know, because it's just so That's incredibly right. difficult to recover and rebuild when you don't have capacity at the county or city level. I can't say that there's one site. I, I have to be frank with you because we're still cracking that nut ourselves. Um, there, there's no one place that I can think of. It's coordinating with, um, I would say, the county as far as um, if there's some, the county or a regional planning commission or council who provides grant writing resources, they may have a formal request process and they can um, you know, if you have identified a grant, or maybe they can, we need a, you know, here's a capacity building, the building blocks, EPA grant, uh, you know, something like that. I don't uh, even think most people know, though, like, I know they don't. Uh, that the EPA has grants. I don't think most people know. I don't think most people actually understand even the levels of government. And I've seen that over and over again. They don't understand the, that um, the state is not the big sister or big brother of the county. And the federal government, mm -hmm. except for certain things like civil rights laws or things like that, is not the big brother. The, the federal government has to be invited in. So with the Dixie Fire is a perfect example. People um, who live in these very rural communities are often very, they want small to no governments, right? But then you have a big disaster that hits and they are increasingly agitated and upset about where is the big government to come and sort of fix this, not even understanding that actually it's, it can often be predicated upon the capacity of your county commissioner, your county um, supervisor, and then at the state level. And because wildfires it's just, we were at three quarters of a million acres before Dixie Fire was declared a federal disaster, before it was requested um, formally um, by our, our, our governor and the uh, senators, uh, Feinstein and Padilla. They, I'm not blaming anyone, just there's a process in place and then it was approved within 24 hours. But people on the ground experiencing the disaster don't understand that. I might have you do a video of like, like, you know how, um, how a bill becomes a law is really, is really helpful for all of <laughs> right. us. Like, sometimes I feel like That's we right. need one on like how government works or, you know, I think we it. have that. I think there's a, a brochure that talks about how it's for states and it talks about how a disaster is declared. I need to find that for you. Find that it, it goes through the, it, yeah, go, it, and I thought, wow, it's th it's a threefold or a three part. I thought that's a lot. <laughs> that's actually though, like you, yeah. you know, we we just downloaded the brick hand handbook uh, today to share, and it, it's only twenty seven pages. And I I'm actually going to read it because twenty seven <laughs> pages is way better than 300 pages. So we only have a few minutes left. I feel like it's gone by so quickly. It has. Um, this what has I would, great. I know. Well, you know, Cherry, you were you, from the very beginning when I first started this podcast, you were on my mind. I was like, I have met some of the most amazing people in this work. And I feel like I want to, I want to introduce them to the world or the 14 so people glad. listening. Yeah. You know, it's okay. Like, <laughs> But right. I was, you know, part of me with COVID was worried, like, what if we weren't, you know, we didn't become after the fire, how can I sort of memorialize all of these really amazing people that I've met along the way? And I definitely include you in that, um, that group of, of very, people who are disaster professionals who have dedicated their lives to this, who bring very much a human, um, not only human element, but a particular competency to the work that is um, probably under um, appreciated outside of uh, this, you know, this room. I don't think people really understand how hard that is. If you were going to leave us with a few, um, you know, tips or ideas or inspiration for people who've just recently experienced a disaster, what would those be? Well, I think I would say, uh, I know your despair is real. It's, you know, it's, it's horrific. There's, um, 
I don't know that there's much anyone can say to comfort you. Uh, it, it takes time, but there are people that want to help. It's it's difficult to make those connections. Um, if if you don't get the answers you want, uh, appeal. I, I think that's something I learned a long time ago. I will leave that at that, the word appeal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I think a lot of times, like we said there, you know, there's an administrative process and we don't understand, not only are we blinded by this disaster and overwhelmed and distraught, we need help and we need, uh, you know, basic help, but you have to hang in there if you have the, the capacity to do so and just, you know, ask, and people do want to help. I think they do just ask the right people and keep asking till you get to the right person. <laughs> That's actually really huge. You know, yeah. um, I can say it um, easier than you can say it. A no is not necessarily a no until you've asked at least three times. <laughs> well, I don't know if there's a number. But well, I'm saying at least no, three times that that's in yes. our experience that if you yeah, were denied right. for any reason, you got to keep going back. And if and really you have a right to also know the why of the no. And so if there's something small Perfect. that you have to do or um yeah. If you, so if you wanted to, I would love it if you would leave a, um, you know, a, do, you, do you want people to visit you on LinkedIn or is there, or do you want them just Please to do. Add, connect yeah. with me? Um, I, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Twitter and I'm on uh, Facebook and I don't post too much about personal, but I really try to share these resources as best I can. So yeah. I'm happy to have them connect with me if you want to, uh, you, I'll send you my IR, my, the integrated recovery coordination. I'm currently in Georgia. I'm happy to, if someone wants to email me personally, I'm happy to connect them with my resources because as you know, they're not always state specific and I'm happy to provide referrals and help them. And if they're, if they're state or city or town, it's possible we could connect them to our disaster recovery resource library. And that's so much of how this work gets done is through networks and community, you know, it's person to community, person, community to community. Um, I know that it, it's made a huge difference in my work um, with the uh, the networking of when you all talk to each other and then you, you, you know, you pass good ideas around and you try to bring good people into your fold. And uh, it's truly a remarkable group of people that I have met to work for FEMA or, you know, the Texas GLO. I had uh, Dr. Lopez on a couple months ago. So I just really want to thank you for your work and your service. It is service to um, this country. And when people are most vulnerable. So thank you so much, Cherry Jokum, for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. And can I say that you are an amazing person. I had a connection with you from the beginning. I've watched you. You're doing, you're doing a lot for disaster recovery. And I love how to disaster and only a genius like you can come up with that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, I can't uh, go with the genius thing, but I can say that I am I'm relentlessly sort of uh, inspired by the puzzle of this work and, and, and the people that I meet along the way who are really doing everything they can to make this really awful experience better. And that's what keeps me in the game, even when sometimes the game sucks at times. You know, you're like, oh, this was really difficult. And how am I going to make it through? And then you remember. You are part of a team of people. That's right. And I I applaud you for uh, using social as you do. And I think it's very effective. And I think in a small way, that's what I'm trying to do. But I think what you're doing is extremely effective. And I I think all of the folks impacted by the fires um, should be grateful to you. And I know I am. And I'm not part of it, but I'm, I'm, I'm watching and I care. (laughs) <laughs> oh, that's actually, uh, you know, that's really honestly like 80% of the battle. So thank you again, uh, Cherry. I'd love to have you on and, um, and keep doing the good work out there. Me too. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for joining us on the podcast, How to Disaster. For more information, please visit our website at afterthefireusa.org. And if you liked this video, please hit subscribe. Fannie Mae provides mortgage options for you and your family. If you have a mortgage owned by Fannie Mae, you may have financial options available after a disaster, such as forbearance plans, deferral of payments, lending assistance, and counseling. Find out more from our Disaster Response Network. Go online at www.knowyouroptions.com relief 
or call 1-877-833-1746 today.